Good morning. Hope everyone's doing all right out there. Also, like TJ said, welcome to those of you joining us online. I actually got a text from someone this morning who showed me a picture of them uh, watching our service as they sit on the beach. So, hope you're having a great time. Not going to call you out in front of everyone, but I'm certainly happy for you, mostly. So glad that we can be together as a church no matter where we are. Thankful for that. But uh, this morning, uh, I was thinking back uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I was visiting some friends, me and Caitlin were over, and their young kids have been really getting into the VeggieTale songs. Like they, they found like a Spotify playlist or something, so they listen to them, they sing them over and over. So they're like, oh, come sing these songs with us, you know. So we're vi- revisiting this, and I was like, oh, wow, I had forgotten about, or I thought I had forgotten about so much of this, but it's there. It never goes away. It just implants itself in your brain, and it sticks with you. But how many VeggieTale fans do we have out there? Oh, yeah, a lot. So you know what I'm talking about. You got your favorite silly song with Larry, obviously the water buffalo song. Everybody's got a water buffalo. Yours is fast, mine is slow. I don't know where we got them. No, now you have that song in your head. You're welcome. I'm not sorry. Enjoy that all morning. That'll be the little backdrop to the sermon all morning, water buffaloes. I don't know if that's going to work out. But anyway, I'm so glad we, we love that. It's great to have those memories. I think back to watching those movies, um, reading those stories. I think back to when I was in Sunday school. You know, we hear some of these familiar Bible stories. Uh, even when I was uh, in high school, I remember taking my sister to see the, the Jonah movie. It was a big deal. I was trying to score some cool Big Brother points, so I took my little sister to go see Jonah. That was a lot of fun uh, just to go. And, and, and I have to admit, I went in thinking, like, I'm doing this for her. But I came out thinking that was actually pretty good. So it was a lot of fun, good laughs. We hear the story, we become familiar with these stories, but then sometimes as adults, when we come to these stories in the book of the Bible, we kind of just skip over them and go, I know what that's all about. And we don't think, I need to go back and revisit that. And so this morning I want to ask, when is the last time you actually went back and revisited and kind of read, took your time and critically looked through the story of Jonah? Because there's so much there. It's such a rich text. It's so beautiful, and there's so much that we can uncover together. And so we are going to spend the next several weeks together going through this story of Jonah. And I'm really excited to do that because it's just such a unique story in the Bible, unlike any other. And, And there's so much to uncover, and it's really not just a children's story. In fact, so many of the themes and the things in the story of Jonah are really best understood when we get a little bit older as adults and we can really dig in and understand. So why? Why are we going to spend our time on Jonah? Well, there's a couple reasons, and it's not, I promise, just because I really like whales. And I do. I know that my love for whales is well known in these parts, but uh, it's not the reason that we're doing this. Actually, we talked uh, this last month about why the Bible matters. And we talked about how the Bible is God-breathed for us to use to be equipped to follow him, right? Used for teaching and rebuking and understanding who God is. And that includes all of Scripture, including the Old Testament. So I want to be sure that as we go through our year studying the Bible together, we spend time every single year as a part of our cycle of studying God's Word in the Old Testament. And I want to start in Jonah, and I think it's a great place for us to start because right now we're in a time where Our world has changed a lot around us in this last year, and our church has changed a lot in this last year. And so the question that I think is going to be before us as we move forward together is, what does God have for us? What is his vision for us as people following him? What is his vision for us as the church trying to follow him? What is he calling us to? And I think this book is really going to help us to be equipped to follow him no matter what it is that God asks us to do going forward together. Because I think we should be ready and prepared to go wherever it is he leads us, no matter what he asks of us, who he asks us to minister to, to, where he asks us to go. We want to be ready. We want to be excited to follow him. And this book is a great resource to help equip our hearts and our minds to do just that. So I'm excited to spend some time together in Jonah. Uh, But why? Why is this a perfect resource? Uh, So I want to take a look Uh, together at just what is this book about. So today we're going to kind of get an overview and an understanding of what what is this book and where is it taking us and what are some of the main themes so we can dig in together and be looking for them as we study. 
So this book is about so many things, and I said, so many kind of more adult topics that we can kind of dig into and understand, and some of those include, you know, God's deep love for people, not just in our church or in our community, but outside. People who are in any way considered to be outside, God has deep love for them and wants to show us that through this story. God wants to show us through this story how to be on mission in our world despite this constant uh, pull that idolatry has on our hearts and our minds. Uh, he wants us to be faced with our inability to let his grace grow in us and change us from within. And, and, and there's the themes of underestimating God's power and what he can do in this world. And it also has a lot of time for us to reflect on our pride, our hard-heartedness. But all of these things, there's so many things we go into, are under this one umbrella, this one theme, which is Jonah, the main character in the story, has a vision for his life that is radically different than the one that God has for him. Radically different. Now, Jonah's vision does not take him out of his comfort zone, and it's, it's not really a vision that is going to be challenging to him or really takes into account anything that God desires for his life. God has a separate plan, and Jonah's vision comes into tension with that. Tim Keller puts this uh, in a really helpful way in his book, The Prodigal Prophet. He says, Jonah wants a God of his own making, a God who simply smites the bad people, for instance, the wicked Ninevites, and blesses the good people, for instance, Jonah and his countrymen. And when the real God, not Jonah's counterfeit, keeps showing up, Jonah's thrown into fury or despair. Now, we might reference this book a few times. If you want to follow along and dig a little bit deeper, I encourage you to check it out, uh, The Prodigal Prophet. There's many other resources we'll look at too, but this one's really helpful uh, and really accessible, so I encourage you to take a look. But what is he getting at here? What is Pastor Keller talking about? Jonah wants a God of his own making, a God that he has created himself. So when he's interacting with God, when he's following God, he has his own idea, his own picture of what that's going to look like. And that's why this series is called The Gospel According to Jonah. Because Jonah has his own view of what it means to follow God, his own version of the gospel, his own picture of his world that he wants to follow, and that just comes in conflict with God's view of the world. And so we're going to take a look at that together because Jonah, he wants to write his own story. He wants to serve God in his own way. And when it doesn't work out, as Pastor Keller pointed out, he just gets angry, he gets upset. And we might experience that too. We might feel that. Jonah's not the only one here. That's why it's a perfect book to help us look in the mirror and examine our hearts as we come up against what does God have for us as he leads us and how do we feel, how do we react when we're faced with God's vision for our lives. Now as we go through Jonah and really as we go through any passage in scripture, I really want us to consider one thing, to approach the Bible in a very specific way. As we read through this story, I want to challenge you not to approach the Bible with your own version of reality, right? We're not coming to God's word and saying, God, can you validate the way that I look at my life, right? Can, can we, sometimes we come to God's word and we just kind of contort God into this shape or this box that we want him to be in, and God's trying to get, he's trying to show himself to us for his fullness and who he really is. So as we come to God's word, I just ask we would come with open hands and open hearts and open minds and say, God, what is it that you have for me? What do you want to teach me today? I want to be there. I want to meet you there. I want to understand you in that way. So let's pray to that end before we dig in. God, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that we could see you for who you really are, not for who we may want you to be or who we want to see you as, but God, help us to really come humbly before you and humbly to your word so that we can understand you, we can know you, we can see you. God, you're so good. You're so great. We just celebrated last week how great you are and all that you've done for us. Father, help us to humbly approach with open hands as we open your word. In your name, amen. So let's do that now. Let's uh, go and we'll go to the beginning of Jonah and open God's word together with an open mind and take a look and see what he has for us. So we're going to look today at Jonah 1, 1 to 3. It starts with this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. We're going to stop right there. <laughs> There's a couple things that are helpful to know as we get to this point. Because if you read ahead, you'll see that the author of this book, of this story, assumes 
right away we go, oh yeah, that guy. I absolutely know who you're talking about. But he doesn't give us any more information about Jonah or who he is. He just says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. So the question is, who is this Jonah guy? What are we supposed to just know? What are the readers of this story supposed to go, oh yes, I know who that is, right? The first thing is that Jonah is a prophet. Now anytime you hear the word of the Lord came to in scripture, almost often it's because you're, you're hearing the words from a prophet. So if you read through uh, some of the prophets in the Old Testament, a lot of them you go to Micah. If you just flip your page, it's probably one page over in your Bible. Um, you'll see it starts with, and the word of the Lord came to the prophet Micah, or something really close to that. Or sometimes the other prophets will say, and a vision from the Lord came to, insert name of the prophet. So we know right away, based on how this story is written, that Jonah is a prophet. But if we didn't know just because of that, we would also know it because there's historical reference in Kings that we'll get to in a second that gives us a little more story and insight into Jonah. But the unique thing about the story of Jonah, the thing that makes it unlike all the other prophet books that we'll read, is this is not actually going to be a word of the Lord from Jonah to us. This is going to be a story about Jonah the prophet. There's no other book that does this. All the times when prophets show up in the Bible, they come and they say to God's people, here's the warning from God so you can turn from your wicked ways and turn towards God. That's why the prophets are there, to speak to God's people. But in this one, it's a story about Jonah. So for us to understand what God's message is, his message to us, his message to the people in the story, we have to understand the story, see the picture that's being painted, and kind of see what the themes and the lessons are that we can pull from it. Because it's not going to be this direct word from God like it normally is when you read other prophets. It's a fascinating story, a tale, if you will, that is so unique. <sighs> Sorry, I get stuck up on my like really cheesy puns, and then I'm like, oh, that was really good. And then I think about it, and it wasn't. It was terrible. I apologize. And then my brain just locks up, and it's like there's nothing else there. Oh, man. I don't know how the dad jokes start so early. So in order for us to understand God's message, we have to see the full story. We have to find those themes and pick them out. Uh, this kind of reads, Jonah reads kind of like one of Jesus' parables, where he kind of paints this picture for us. Um, and the characters are kind of normal, but they do unexpected things in the story. So take this story of Jonah, for example. He is one of God's messengers, his prophet, who in all other stories, they go out and they give the message to God's people. But in this one, we know he refuses to do that. This is so unusual. This is so unlike any other prophets. Uh, and then the really bad characters in the story, the Ninevites, are the ones that actually do the right things. And the good characters in the story are the ones that don't do any of the right things. It's a, it's a backwards story that's really unique and has a lot of irony, has a lot of humor. As we dig in in the next few weeks, we're going to see God has quite a sense of humor. Um, and he's incorporated it into his word through the story of Jonah. So I'm excited to dig in, but yeah, first thing, Jonah is a prophet, and the story is about him, not from him. But also, we see some things in history, that Jonah actually lived during the reign of Israel's king, Jeroboam. Now, the name of the king doesn't matter, this is not, there's no history test, but there are some traits that we learn about Jonah in his interaction with this king that help us to get to know his character that will really be relevant as we go through his story. So, Jeroboam was a king in Israel who was really known for his aggressive military tactics. He wanted to expand the kingdom and really build it up, but he did it in such a way that brought about a lot of injustice and wasn't very faithful to God. And actually, other prophets such as Amos and Hosea, if you go and read in those books, call him out and say, King Jeroboam and all of Israel, you are doing very unjust and wicked things and you need to turn from this. But Jonah is the prophet who says, no, no, no. I support this king and what he's doing. And it really kind of made the people scratch their head a little bit like, this doesn't work. Why? What's, there's some dissonance here. Why would this prophet be supporting, supportive of this king? So what do we learn about Jonah from this? Well, to simplify a really big and complex story, Jonah is a really patriotic guy. He really loves his country, and that's not a bad thing. But as a prophet, he's supposed to be there to hold accountable his leaders, hold them accountable to God and God's mission and vision and desire, and he doesn't do that. Instead, he supports their actions even when they're unjust, and the other prophets call him out on that. So Jonah is a guy 
uh, who's kind of all in for his team no matter what, even at the cost of doing what God has sent him to do. So with this in mind, when we get to this story, when readers hear Jonah, son of Amittai, and then we go through the story and hear what God is going to do, people will be really surprised to hear that, why is God sending Jonah? Jonah's such a homer, and you're sending him to this other country to go and try to tell them about God and to call them out. This doesn't make sense. So readers would be surprised. So let's go to our next verse here and see um, what do we have as we move forward in the story. God gives Jonah this command. The word comes to him, and he says, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. There's a couple things we need to know about Nineveh for this story to make more sense for us. Nineveh was the capital of an Assyrian empire. This was one of Israel's greatest enemies. Uh, They had a lot of enemies, but this one was very wicked, very bad. Uh, There's a lot of gory uh, violence in in all of their victories. Uh, They didn't really care. They did some pretty terrible things. They actually created uh, these large, uh, I I think I want to call this a relief sculpture. Can I get a nod from my artistic wife? Yes, perfect. Um, (laughs) I had to look that up. I did not know. Uh, But they would actually celebrate, and this is a very, like, PG image. They have some really bad ones of things that they would put in stone and celebrate their really gory victories of beheading the people that they conquered and, and pulling their limbs off and just doing terrible things to them. And they didn't care. They just wanted to expand their kingdom as much as possible. And no one wanted to go near them because their reputation preceded them. So it kind of worked in their favor. They intimidated their enemies. They came in and they did terrible things. And if somehow you lived through their conquering of your nation, they enslaved you and made you do just horrible things. And they celebrated it. And they had big shrines and murals like this one that would celebrate their victories. These people are terrible and just gross. And God is asking Jonah to go to them to speak his words to them. That is so unusual for so many reasons. First of which is that up to this point in the story, when God had spoken to his prophets and given them a word to say, he just sent them to his own people. He normally did not send them actually out as missionaries to the Gentiles, but he comes to Jonah and he says, no, I want you to go to Nineveh. So the first thing that's weird is he sends a prophet outside of his own people. So Jonah's like, what, why, God, are you calling me to this? You don't normally do this. But the second thing is, why Nineveh? Why a place that's this bad and this evil? Because Jonah and his people, normally in their history, as these things would happen and countries would grow and come up and be this bad, God would take one of his armies and he would come and conquer them and destroy them. So Jonah was actually expecting that that would happen, so he didn't really care about them at all. He wasn't concerned with them. And when God says, go to Nineveh, go to these people who are so awful and terrible, Jonah's like, what? First of all, why are you sending me a prophet? And second of all, why to this place? And thirdly, this is just unusual because remember, Jonah himself is this guy um, that cares so deeply for, deeply for his country, is so patriotic and cares about the expansion of his country. He's not worried at all about his enemies being okay. That is not the way he thinks or who he is or true to his character. He's not concerned for his enemies. He's concerned for growing his people and his nation. So he would be very confused hearing this instruction. And someone reading this story would get to this part and be like, oh, God just sent who to where? Someone get the popcorn because this is amazing. I cannot, I cannot wait to see how he reacts and what happens. This is what would be happening in the story. It would be, I know it's hard for us to kind of wrap our heads around this, so let's, let's bring this down here, break this down to something we can understand. Football. We can handle that. So... I'm sure someone in this room knows who this person is. Yes, I see a lot of heads nodding. And some younger people going, no, 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 I have no idea. This is Bud Grant. And he is arguably the most Viking of all the Vikings who ever was a Viking, right? He uh, is the best coach they've ever had, a coach for 18 seasons, took them to four Super Bowls. He is a legend in Minnesota. Now, I mean, he bleeds purple and gold. I've not tried, but I'm sure that it's true. I believe it with all my heart that if you pricked him, it's purple and gold. So imagine if the owner of the Vikings said to Bud Grant, I need you to go to Green Bay to walk into Lambeau on a Sunday morning with a full stadium and tell them all to set down their cheese, take off the green and gold, and put on the purple. 
right? He'd be like, I mean, I'm a Vikings fan, but no, those guys are a lost cause. Like, I'm not going over to Lambeau, right? This is unbelievable. Why are you asking me to do this? I am the most Viking Viking there is, and you want me to go and do this thing? It doesn't make any sense. Now, this, of course, is a very tame example. Um, A more serious example of this would actually be uh, if you think about in World War II, and if you think of a, a Jewish rabbi being sent into Nazi-occupied Germany and, being, and coming to say to them, turn from your wicked ways, what you're doing is wrong, his life would be at stake. He, I think we can all imagine he wouldn't make it very far if he tried to do this. And this is what Jonah's thinking. I'm not even going to make it through the gates of Nineveh, and, and I don't even want to go there. Why would I do this? God, why are you sending me to do this? It doesn't make any sense. It's so unusual. This story of what God is trying to show us in this picture of Jonah is so unusual and unlike anything else in the Bible for these reasons and so many more that we're going to uncover. Oh, yes, there we go. See, he already has that look where he's just looking at him like, "Mm, I don't know. Yeah. So let's keep going in our story, though, right, as we go through Jonah and take a look. So what is the reaction of Jonah. So God says, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh. I want you to preach against it and its wickedness. But what happens next? Well, sorry, I didn't mean to highlight that gray for you there. So it's it's hard to read. But this is what Jonah, how he reacts and how he responds. He says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. (laughs) <laughs> so I was reading this this week and just trying to come to it with an open mind, right? And just trying to place myself in the story. And I just laughed out loud when I got to verse 3. Because I'm like, there's so many things Jonah could have done. And he's just so dramatic, right? You guys ever watch the soccer games where the guys just get touched a little bit and they're like down on the ground and they just, you know, they're just totally showing it, right? He's being so dramatic here. I was just imagining... You know, normally when I'm given an option or a choice to do something or asked to do something, like, isn't a normal reaction just to say no? Like, if Caitlin says, like, hey, can you go to the store and just get me some eggs? Uh, I'd be, you know, I have some options, right? I could be like, yes, I'll go. I could also be like, no, I don't want to do that. But then there's even some other options. Like, uh, maybe I'd go to the store and buy some ice cream, you know, a little cherry chip flavored rebellion. Just come home with ice cream, no eggs. Yeah, th- there's that option. I, c- I could just kind of be lazy, come home later and say, oh, I forgot, forgot to go to the store. But <laughs> in what world do I get in my car, hop on the interstate, and just drive to Wisconsin, right? When Caitlin says, hey, can you go get me some eggs? Like, what? This is what Jonah does. God says, hey, I need you to go do this thing. And he's like, you know, I'm going to get a boat. I'm going to go as far away in the known world as I possibly can because that will show you. What a drama, mama. Just unbelievable. He just, he is so focused on his vision of the world and the way he wants it to be that he just goes the complete opposite direction. But why? Why could, why would someone possibly do this? Why does Jonah run? What's going on in his heart that would lead him to make such a strange choice? Now, I know we talked about the danger We talked about the challenge of going into Nineveh and how very difficult that would be. Now, for me, that would maybe be enough to scare me away. But we actually have the answer. We're going to dig into it more later, but I'm going to show you. Spoilers, if you don't want to know the end, here it is. It's coming. Why does Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? We see in chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. So what just happened before this is the Ninevites turned back to God and turned away from their wickedness and embraced him. So Jonah is struggling with this. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing. I knew that you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah admits, I didn't go because I knew it would work. I I didn't want them to be saved. I didn't want them to be rescued. God, I knew you were compassionate. I knew you were loving. And I I didn't want that for these people. What? That doesn't make you pause and just think for a minute. (laughs) That is quite a statement. 
How does a heart get to that place of making that statement? Don't miss this here. Jonah has a very specific vision for his own life and a vision of his God that is so different than what God wants for Jonah and who God is. This is at the core of the whole story of Jonah, what it's all about. This is what we're going to explore together and unpack the next few weeks as we go through this story. There's this tension between what we think, what Jonah thinks, his vision for his life is, and what it actually is from God, how God actually sees the world. Jonah's vision is destruction for his enemies, not a happy ending. No, he doesn't want a happy ending. I, I, when I watch a movie, I like a happy ending. I don't know about you. Uh, Caitlin really likes happy endings. We both, that works out for us. We like movies with happy endings. Sometimes we ask, is this going to end okay? If it feels like it's not, maybe we're not going to watch it because that's disappointing. Jonah doesn't want the happy ending. He doesn't want success for his enemies. Jonah wants comfort. He doesn't want to leave his own country that he wants to see succeed as much as possible and go to a foreign land, people who are working actively against him. And then there's this pride. <laughs> there's, the, there's this idea that if Jonah goes to his enemy and actually rescues them and brings them to God, that his countrymen, his friends, are not going to be super impressed and happy. They're going to be like, why did you go and rescue our enemy? Like, we're against these people. That doesn't look very good on him. It's not a great way to, you know, win friends, to go and win over your enemies. Jonah's got pride in the way. This story of Jonah is a story about sort of the nature, the psychology of our identity and our disobedience and our relationship with God. It's a story about reconciling our vision for the world with God's vision for the world and for our lives. And it's a story about our desire but ultimate inability, no matter how far we go or how hard we try to run away from God. We can't do it. We just can't do it. And when we run away from him, we're basically saying no to these amazing, incredible things. God asked Jonah to be a part of one of the most incredible missionary trips ever ever. And Jonah admits right here that he knew it was going to work. I mean, come on. How many of you, if you were asked to do something really amazing and you knew it was going to work, would say no? I, I, that'd be hard to say no. If I knew it was going to have success, I fully believe that. Why would I not go forward with that thing? Especially if God asked me, say God asked you, uh, and it could be anything, but say he asked you, it'll be a missionary to China. And, and to share God's word with him, and you know in your heart, if I go and do this by the power of God, the whole country is going to turn back to him. Why, why would you not want to be a part of that? Of course there's fear. Of course there's things that come in the way. But God has this amazing vision for our lives, these amazing things he wants to do through us. We see all throughout scripture that God wants to use his people every stop of the way in God's redeeming story. He wants to use his people to bring about amazing things in the world. He doesn't do it on his own. He includes us in his mission. But Jonah's vision of the world has taken so much hold of him. He doesn't want to be included in this once-in-a-lifetime miracle opportunity. I can't imagine the amount of pride and hard-heartedness that it would take to turn down an opportunity like that with God. But <laughs> I, I can't be the first one to throw a stone here, right? Of course we know a little bit about that level of pride and hard-heartedness, and that's what we're going to talk about as we uncover this over the next few weeks in Jonah's story. Now, like I mentioned earlier, our world has changed so much this year, our church has changed, but our mission has stayed the same. God has called us together to make disciples, as he has for the last 150 years. In fact, it'll be 151 this summer at Crossroads, and we'll uh, actually take some time to really celebrate that well this summer. And I believe that God's going to continue to lead us, continue to guide us and his church towards how we're going to accomplish that mission. But I think he's also going to ask us to do some really hard things. And it's not always going to be easy. And we're not always going to want to do it. And these things might be different than our personal vision of what our lives look like and what our church should look like. But when God calls us towards this vision, we're going to have a choice to make. Are we going to run from it or are we going to move back towards God? Are we going to trust him and take a step forward? 
it's really interesting, but it's true of most humans, most of us in this room, that I think we just prefer uh, if things in our life just don't change much, if they kind of stay the same, right? We don't like change. Uh, we don't like to be called to do things that bring us out of our comfort zone, whether in our personal lives or whether in the life of the church, it's really hard to experience those things. I think we'd prefer that maybe everything stay like 90, 95% exactly the same, and maybe we'll say, okay, God, I'm going to give you this like 5 or 10%, go crazy, right? Like do whatever you want in my life over here and the church over here, but like overall, like let's just leave it alone. But when we look at the story of Jonah, God didn't just touch 10%. God asked Jonah to be all in, and he changed everything in his life. And he asked Jonah to follow him and trust him, even though there's so many points along the way where Jonah was like, I don't think so. This seems really strange. I, I don't want to be a part of this. I have a different view. I have a different vision for my life and for my ministry. It's so hard to give God everything. I mean, I think in my personal life, you know, even like with my own finances, what am I willing to give to God, right? Some of us think maybe 5, 10, 15%. We all figure out what it is that God's calling us to come and serve him with. But what if God asks more? What if he asks 50, 60, 70? What if God asks way more than we're comfortable with? That's hard. It's the same thing in a church. What if God comes, you know, we, we say we want to reach people, and we do, and in our hearts, we all desperately do. We want to bring the gospel to the community, to the world. But what if that means being different than what we are? What if that means having our expectations met in a different way because God has a different vision for where we want to go? You know, what if we learned, for example, just pull something out of a hat that, we, that God was calling us and saying, you know, you need to have church on Saturday night because this is going to be so much more effective in reaching people. That would be uncomfortable. I love Sunday morning gatherings. And now, trust me, this is not me, like, setting you up for some, like, secret plan <laughs> that I have for the church. I do not. We are going to have so much conversation together as a family and asking God, where are you leading us? Where are you taking us? And I don't know what that's going to be. But I know that I want to be ready. I know I want my heart to be prepared to run towards God and to not run away, no matter what it is that he calls us to. So that's why we're going through this book to prepare our hearts, to come before God and say, God, can you do a work in us? Can you find those places where there's that pride and that hard heart in us and work in us to soften us and to trust you so that no matter what you ask us to do, we're ready to be a part of it because we know it's going to be exciting and thrilling and it's going to bring people back to you. So are we willing this morning to give this to God? This, this, is our, this is our application question this morning. Are we willing to follow God's vision instead of our own? The big umbrella question through this whole story of Jonah that we're going to unpack. Are we willing to follow God's vision instead of our own? Are we willing to lay all of it on the table and listen to his direction? Or are we just content to pursue our own vision and our own path of life and just hope that as we go forward, God will just bless whatever we choose to do without li listening to him and coming before him. And the second question, and this is a fair question, and one that I want to wrestle with too, what is the most difficult part of our vision to let go of? There are going to be things that we just want to hang on to, and which pieces are really hard to let go? And we don't know. God might ask us to do this or that. We don't know which. We don't have to necessarily let go of all of it. It's not necessarily all going to change, but we need to be prepared in our hearts to trust God no matter what he asks of us. So which aspects of your life is it hard to loosen your grip on? I encourage you to take some time to reflect on that, not only throughout this week, but throughout these next few weeks as we continue to study through Jonah. Now I admit, and I, I fully understand, that this might all sound really hard. And you might have come in this morning thinking, I don't want to hear this message. <laughs> we just celebrated an Easter and God is so great and we're so filled with hope and excitement. Why, why this hard stuff? I get that. It sounds hard. But the thing is, we're not on our own. And the glorious thing about Easter is that God already conquered all of it. He is big enough and strong enough to help us to be whoever he needs us to be to accomplish his mission. We will do it by his power, not our own. If that feels hard for you, that's God saying, I want you to remember that you need me. You can't do this all by yourself. Trust me. We're going to build trust with God as we walk forward together 
trying to accomplish his mission. We looked at this together on Good Friday, but Jesus knows what this feels like. He was confronted with his vision and God's and trying to decide what to do next as he went to the garden and he was with his disciples and he knew it was about to happen. He knew he was going to lose his life. And he went for a time of prayer with God to be really honest. And he said, God, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. God, I don't want to do this. It sounds really hard. I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know what thoughts were going through his mind. But he says, God, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. But then he says, but even though I feel that way, yet not as I will, but as you will, God. Jesus sets this example for us to trust God no matter what we face, no matter what comes before us. I just mentioned last Sunday we celebrated Easter. We celebrated because Jesus trusted God and God's vision for his life. We celebrated a Savior that honored God by living a perfect life and dying on our behalf and conquering death so that he can offer us forgiveness and grace and true life. And when we experience that, we are made new and we leave the old behind. I'm sure you're familiar with this passage from 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. God makes us new, and a part of being made new is setting aside the old, setting aside the pieces of our life that we need to surrender to God, we need to leave behind, that we need to die to, so that we can be made new in Him and trust Him fully. Because God has so much planned for us. So much, more than we could ever imagine, more than we could ever come up with on our own, and I can't wait to see what it is. Now, again, this maybe scares you or makes you uncomfortable. You're not the only one. I I have no idea how God is going to lead. But I really don't want to run away. And I really don't want us to run away from whatever it is God has for us. Because as we're going to see in the story of Jonah, it doesn't work out very well. Right? I, I, I mean, I don't know what it's like to be in the belly of a fish. It doesn't sound great. I mean, I don't like pickles, but I imagine it smells like that times a million. Ugh. Right? God is relentless. He will pull us back towards himself. Even if we try to run away, we can't. There's no point. Instead of running, let's prepare our hearts for what God will ask of us, whatever it might be. Whatever it might be, because I think we'll see amazing things. And because we're in this together, and I'm so glad that we are, Crosswords. I'm so glad that we're on this journey, pursuing God, carrying out his mission, and trusting him together, and there to support one another. Let's pray. God, I thank you this morning. You are so merciful. That you're so loving and generous and good. God, we have a lot to wrestle with in our lives. We have so many things in the vision that we have of our lives that doesn't necessarily mesh with who you call us to be and where you call us to go. God, help us to wrestle with that, to struggle with that, to come before you with open hands as we come to your word, accepting your word as presented to us, not contorting you to fit into our lives and asking you to bless that. God, it's not easy We need your power in our lives to accomplish this. Help us to meet you face to face, to be in your presence, to experience your power each day as we work to become more like you. God, help us to trust you as we walk with you and towards you. In your name, amen.